The year 1923 was a significant period in our history. It saw the end of the Irish Civil War, the formation of a new government in the recently established Irish Free State, and the country taking its place among the nations of the world. It was a year that meant different things to many people. Here we would take a look at the social history of County Wexford through the various news, events and incidents as reported in the Echo newspaper in order to gain a better understanding of what life was like 100 years ago in 1923. One of the more interesting articles to appear in the Echo in May of 1923 tells the tale of a husband and wife touring County Wexford on bicycle. Both wrote under the alias of Ku Klux and Clossy, and the pair made their way through North Wexford, passing through Ferns, in Escorty, Clan, and finally Bunclody. Along their journey, they describe many sights and scenes which are reminiscent of Ireland during the latter weeks of the Irish Civil War, encountering several bridges which have been blown up or damaged in the preceding months, and even being told to just turn over and go back to sleep if they heard bombs and machine guns at night while resting overnight in a hotel in Bunclody. The couple arrived in Dublin and passed through County Wicklow, and their first resting place in Wexford was in Ferns. Here they stayed in Let's Hotel, which they described as excellent, and the next day they set out for an escorty, and wrote the following of their experience. About four miles out from Ferns we came to Scar Welsh Bridge of six arches over the Slaney River. In the central arch was a great hole, and less than half the road which was available. One or two branches were chucked across the chasm to keep traffic out of it. Motor lorries, they told us, are still using it, but it was obviously sinking under the, under the strain. They then went on to describe how things would have been done in their native country of England, stating, In England, there would have been formidable barriers of poles and trestles, with red-lettered warnings, and a night watchman. Continuing on past Scar Welsh, the couple stated how Inniscorty came next, a town of size and obvious prosperity with various industries and the Slaney River getting bigger. But Inniscorty was close shuttered, it being Ascension Day. When we had climbed out of the town to a high and open country, the road ahead lay in geometrical straight lines, undulating always, and the dust coming along in racing clouds, as though the road boiled furiously. We set our teeth, used our low gears on the level and downhill, and walked the slightest upgrade, and still, the sun shone brightly. Continuing on their journey past Enniscorthy, the couple came across Ballymacassey Bridge, which had been damaged during the Civil War. The couple stated how Ballymacassey Bridge had three arches over the beautiful as a stream as you could wish to see. The centre arch was gone. Its ruins lay some yards below, and the river flowed through the other two. Some three feet below the road level, a couple of large poles side by side spanned the gap in a precarious footbridge. A group of men stood idly by. It was Ascension Day. One came forward to offer help, and I surrendered the job to him gladly. We climbed down over the debris and up the other side. The Irishman crossed the large pole path with a laden bicycle in his hands, and I could not and would not have done it. I just hauled him up to a road level from his hands. Another brief spell at an average speed of six miles per hour, and our road turned sharply under a patched up railway bridge. A great timber balk rose from the middle of the road to help it, and on the grass alongside were broken and twisted girders of steel. What the couple was describing was one of the many railway bridges which had been damaged in County Wexford during the Civil War. Continuing on past Ballymacassie Bridge, the couple had come across another ruined crossing, and also a change in the weather. They state how soon after a big river had joined our bridge, we crossed this little tributary by a bridge of which a five foot width was available for traffic. The rest was a hole with branches across it. The wind in the morning was almost a gale and very cold. We soon got pretty high, and all that we could see all the ways was a feast of colour. But twice or thrice, in each hour, such a blizzard of hail and icy rain blotted out the land that we were glad of the lee side of banks for shelter, and had to crush many primroses and violets and heart-tongue ferns. Continuing on in their journey, the couple described how, a little further, we came on Tomenane Bridge, 
spanning the bonnie river that came down from the purple mass of Blackstairs Mountains, four miles away. There was a great hole in the middle of the bridge, and not even branches over it. There was nice room for bicycles, but the donkey car drivers had to steer their outside wheels onto a loose bank over the gap itself. As usual, we had a late breakfast and a late start, having little choice in the matter. At three in the afternoon, we wanted food, and there did not seem to be anything but gorse and granite boulders, goats and mountains. But the tiny hamlet of Killan, which looked as if life of late had been too exciting, possessed a small general store, and sold me a half-pound packet of biscuits. That was our lunch, sitting on rocks and very good too. After the eighth biscuit, however, salivation becomes difficult, so when a mile or two further, Blackstairs Mountain disappeared completely, and a tempest drove us into a little barn. Clossy suggested milk, having spotted a cow or two in the byre. Going in search of some milk, the couple wrote, I went through the hail of bullets or bullets of hail to one of the most deplorable little shacks I have ever seen in Ireland, and knocked. There was an obvious reconnaissance through a broken window, and then the door was opened very slowly by a fine young fellow in absolute rags. He was uneasy. A knock on the door in remote Ireland may still mean anything, but he brought me a pint of good milk, and when I took the mug back later, he declined resolutely to take money for it. Knowing my Irish friends well, I just pulled out the cigarettes and he melted into cordiality at once. It was too cold in the little barn, so we armoured ourselves and rode on, the storm being longer than usual. It had passed, the sun shone, and Blackstairs Mountain came out higher and more purple than ever. Right across the road, completely blocking it, lay a huge ash tree, sawn through at its base. The single telephone wire dangled from a broken pole. I took a photo, we lifted the bicycles over the trunk, struggled through some minor branches, and went on. Continuing on their journey, the couple described how another blizzard came and passed. We cycled and walked alternately up a climb of three or four miles over a sodden road full of little rills with continuous banks of gorse almost too bright to look upon. Over the high ridge, an excellent falling road turned up, travelling at rare speed for some miles and breaking hard now and again for wandering cows, donkeys or geese, we descended at last, and at 6pm arrived in the wholefully delightful town of Newtown Barry, in the heavily wooded valley of the River Slaney. A host of memories of French tours rushed upon me at the first sight of the first smell of it. The cold air was full of the fragrance of burning wood and peat, a fine avenue of trees and a rapid curb-bound stream between a double row of shops and houses gave the main street charming distinction. With scores of our curious eyes focused on us, we rode round, questing the king's arms, as bidden by the Ku Klux annual. But we saw one called Amal, and our experienced eyes led us to go in without a moment's hesitation. It was even so. In Yorkshire parlance, we had hit lucky. I saw the other hotel later. It was cheek by Joel, with the military barracks most formidably sandbagged against attack, and a gleaming bayonet doing sentry go outside. They told us at the mall just to turn over and go to sleep again if we heard bombs and machine guns in the night. They were quite used to it and didn't mind them, but we slept for nine hours, and nothing happened. While 1923 was marked by the loss of many prominent figures within the Republican movement, the newspapers also reported on the deaths of those abroad. In August of 1923, the death of former New York Police Inspector John J. Hardy was reported. 
Born in Gorey in 1846, he left Ireland to avoid arrest as his father was involved in the Fenian movement and he himself was a member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. He arrived in the USA shortly after the American Civil War and joined the army. In 1876, John along with others set sail on a ship named Aaron's Hope that was bound for Ireland with arms and ammunition for a planned Fenian uprising. By the time they reached Sligo Bay, however, the rising had been suppressed and they were told to proceed southwards towards Munster. After reaching Watford, unnoticed, John with others was brought ashore via fishing boat. While walking the roads, sand and mud on their trousers from wading ashore in shallow waters attracted the attention of local police and John and his friends were arrested. He was sent back to the USA several months later. He later joined the New York police force as a patrolman and then became a sergeant. In 1887 he was promoted to lieutenant and was promoted to captain in 1896. By 1898 he was appointed inspector and served until his retirement in October of 1902. In 1923 the motor car was slowly becoming a common sight along Irish roads. While today there are many aspects of driving modern vehicles which we may take for granted, a look back at a case from 1923 reminds us of very different times. The excuse given by the driver in this case would certainly have received a more shocking report in the newspapers of the day. The heading read No Light and ascribed to a man from Tomalosset was fined for co and costs for having no lights on his car on the night of the first instance. He pleaded that he had been on a long journey and expected to have been home before lighting up time. While some people were lucky enough in 1923 to have access to motor vehicles, others relied heavily on bicycles. For most of that year, due to the ongoing civil war, a permit was required from the military for bicycles. This would have been a nuisance for many people, and the end of the Civil War and subsequent relaxation of such rules would have been very welcomed by many people, no doubt. In 1923, instances of poverty and destitution existed within the country. Accounts of these cases remind us of the hardships which many people faced during this time, and that people still suffered outside of the ongoing Civil War conflict. A case was reported in early 1923 in the Echo newspaper, which serves to highlight the poverty that existed within the country at this time. This was the case of a father and his five children that resulted in the latter being sent to industrial schools due to the conditions within which they lived. The heading read Extreme Destitution, Five Children to be Sent to Industrial Schools. It stated how at Gorey Court, an Inspector Sullivan with the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children applied for orders to send three girls and two boys to industrial schools. The inspector had previously visited the home and found that all seven children were poorly nourished and poorly clad. They had no boots and with the exception of the eldest girl were illiterate. The house consisted of three apartments, a kitchen and two bedrooms. The beds consisted of worn-out mattresses and hay and straw, some torn and decayed quilts being the only bedclothes. The house showed the appearance of extreme destitution. The children were out begging and very much undersized. The father told the court, the inspector, he was out of work and he could not find work. The order was later granted for the children's removal.
Although the intention of many during the War of Independence was to build a better Ireland, the Civil War which followed seemed to lead to an increase in immigration in 1923 than from the previous year during the truce period. In 1923, the Echo newspaper reported on this increase, with an exodus from Cork and Kerry particularly noted. These two counties saw considerable violence during the Civil War, which may help to explain the large influx of immigrants from these areas. During the Civil War, law and order had been thrown into chaos. However, by the end of this period, there was a reduction in violence with the designation of the Civil Guard to various parts of the country. It seems though that some elements took the law into their own hands still. In June of 1923, it was reported how three men were found tied with ropes to the wall outside Boulevard Church, with labels alleging they were robbers. Two rings were placed nearby in the wall reserved for two further culprits. The heading read, tied to church wall, and stated that three men from the district, one a small farmer and the other labourers, were found tied with ropes to the wall outside Boulevard Church on Thursday morning of last week. On their breasts were labels alleging that they were robbers, while nearby two rings in the wall with notices stated that places were reserved for two other culprits. Later after last mass, the men were released, and it is stated where they were warned to leave the district. They have since done so. While much of today's buying and selling takes place online, in 1923 the local fair was the place to do business. Livestock, poultry and other goods were sold in towns and villages on designated dates that usually occurred once a month. In January of 1923, the Echo newspaper reporting on the Inniscorty Fair stated that business was good and fat cattle fetched a price and up to £35 was paid for milch cows. There was a good supply of sheep and small pigs showed an increase of 10 shillings each. There was a small supply of horses and with limited buyers, little business was done. Meanwhile at Bonclody, in May, the fair was not up to the standard as previous other fairs, but it was reported that business was brisk in all sections nonetheless. There was a good supply of cattle, but vendors were disappointed as these were sold for a £3 reduction per head. At the town's pig fair, held at a later date, attendance was poor and business did not meet expectations. The weather also made headlines in 1923. In February, heavy rains were reported which led to flooding in the Bunclodian and Escorty districts. One of the headings read, Heavy Floods. The rainfall during the weekend was the heaviest for many years. The Slaney overflowed its banks, low-lying lands and roads in Inniscorty district were flooded and in some places farm work was impeded. Meanwhile, another heading which read floods, stated that owing to recent heavy downpour of rain, the Slaney overflowed its banks during the weekend at Bunclody and practically covered the bridge meadow. In 1923, the newly formed Civic Guard dealt with many aspects of law enforcement, including the implementation of laws surrounding alcohol consumption. An interesting example of this was reported in May 1923, when one Saturday night, members of the Civic Guard found members of the public on the premises past closing time in River Chapel Village. 
The heading read Licensing Prosecutions, River Chapel Men Find, Those Found on Premises More to Blame Than Publican. It went on to state how the owner of the pub was charged in Gorey Court with a breach of the licensing laws. Two members of the Civic Guard had visited the premises on the night in question at around half nine at night and asked the owner was there anyone inside to which they were told there was not. However, the guards noticed two glasses on the counter, one of which contained a small quantity of porter and the other of which was full. While nobody was found in the kitchen or upstairs, one stranger was found hiding behind the door when they went to search outside. Meanwhile, they noticed another man attempting to get across the gate, but he was quick but he quickly returned when called upon to do so. Both men were then brought inside and questioned. One of the men tried to explain how he could get home to his own yard from that of the public house. When the owner was questioned, he admitted to having both men on the premises. Another incident was reported that same month in Ferns Village with the heading Fern Stampede. A publican was summoned for a breach of the licensing act at around 10 o'clock on that particular night. Seven men were summoned before the court. The guard on duty stated that he found the door to the public house opened, and when he entered, a large crowd was drinking in the bar and kitchen. The owner stated she was going by old time, to which the guard replied that new time applies to the licensing laws. Once he took out his notebook to record the names of those present, however, some of the men, and I quote, moved out. There were two front doors and two back doors, and there was a stampede. Three men were apprehended on the premises, while after chasing a fort across a field, his name too was recorded. After asking the man why he ran away, he replied he was going by old time. Of a total of 12 men on the premises that night, the names of only four were recorded. In March 1923, the death of a Patrick Whelan, believed to be the oldest man in the county at the time, occurred. It was reported he could recount the famine of 1847 or Collins' meetings and the Fenians. The heading read, Centenarian's Debt. Mr. Patrick Whelan, who died in Ballyshane, Camona on Sunday last, age 103, was believed to be the oldest man in County Wexford. He was a splendid specimen of Irish manhood, tall, stately and strong and was remarkable up to 12 or 14 years ago for his great agility. Old inhabitants state that in his prime he was considered the finest man in the county. He could recount many interesting stories about the famine of 1847, O'Connell's meetings and the Fenians. Up to a few years ago he worked on his farm at Ballyshane and often attended affairs at Gorey. The funeral, which took place on Tuesday, was very largely attended and testified to the great popularity of the deceased and his family. The Civil War caused much disruption for people trying to socialise. One popular outing at the time was to attend local dances. Outside of the towns and villages, these were usually held in local halls. There were numerous incidents of the military interrupting these dances in search of particular individuals or weapons. In February of 1923, dancers in Wexford Town were disrupted by the military who proceeded to search all the men in attendance. The ladies, however, were not searched. The heading read, Dancers Searched, and stated that while the prolonged dance was in progress in the Town Hall Wexford on Sunday night, a patrol of national troops entered the dance room at about 10 o'clock and held up the dancers. All the men were searched, but the ladies escaped the ordeal. Nothing of an incriminating nature was discovered, and the troops retired after a short interval. The dance was proceeded with until 3 a.m. A similar incident occurred on New Year's Eve in near Inniscorty. The heading in this case read Arrests at a Dance and stated that military from Inniscorty surrounded a store in Kilcarbury shortly before 10 o'clock on New Year's night during the progress of a dance and called on the occupants to put their hands up. 
Some shots were fired, but no one was hit. A military account afterwards stated that the troops were attacked on entering the building. Three men were arrested, and a revolver and holster were stated to have been found in a subsequent search. One of the men was subsequently released, but the other prisoners were removed to Wexford. In late January 1923, the Echo newspaper reported on an alleged ban on dancing in the Gorey district. It stated that an all-night dance arranged to be held in Bally Thomas Schoolhouse on Friday night was abandoned at the 11th hour by the local national school teacher after he received a warning letter threatening drastic penalties in the event of the fixture being brought off. The envelope bore the Arklow postmark, but there was no signature to the letter itself, and the question of its origin or the identity of the sender is shrouded in mystery. It also reported that a short while ago, a letter couched in similar terms was received by the organisers of a dance at Courtown Harbour, and it will be remembered that in connection with the holding of a ball in Kyle Nairn Schoolhouse, the national school teacher was the recipient of a similar notice. In 1923, the role and influence which religion played in people's lives is evident in the newspapers from the period. An example of this can be seen from February of 1923, when a segment appeared in the Echo stating the regulations for Lent in the Diocese of Ferns, and these outlined the various food products which can and cannot be eaten. The article went on to state that the use of flesh meat is allowed as the principal meal on all days of Lent except Wednesdays, Fridays and Saturdays of quarter tenths. On Holy Saturday, the obligation of a fast ceases at midday. On any day in Lent, eggs, meat, butter and cheese may be taken and lard and dripping may be used as condiments. While flesh meat may be taken during Lent, the use of fish at the same meal is allowed and there is neither fast nor abstinence on Sundays in Lent. Religion also affected public administration and services, and this can be seen in an article with the heading Whit Monday in Post Office. This stated that the Postmaster General announces that the arrangements for Whit Monday at provincial post offices would be the same as on Sundays, i.e. there will be no delivery or collection of letters and parcels and no dispatch of mails. Inward mails will not be sorted, and consequently there will be no delivery to callers. Telegraph offices will be open from half eight to ten a.m. for the transaction of telegraph business and sale of stamps. In 1923, daylight savings was still not agreed upon by many. In some cases, they allegedly caused disruption. In May of that year, the Echo newspaper reported on how a roadworks tender contract was dismissed for being entered late, and this was blamed on the contractor being on old time as opposed to new time. The article heading read, New Time and Old. In a meeting held in Gorey Town Hall, it was stated that the chairman said that two tenders were handed in before the meeting commenced, and it was for the council to decide whether they would deal with them or not. The tender should have been in before the advertised date. It was decided to deal with the tenders if no other tenders were received for the same road for which the two were handed in. And Mr. P. Byrne then raised the question of a contractor who lived in the country where old time was observed, and who had come to the meeting on the last occasion but found he was 20 minutes late. He didn't think it was fair to keep back He's this tender. The clerk responded by saying there is only one time. Suppose this man was half an hour late for the bank. He would have to wait. Mr. P. Byrne then stated, you must remember there are two times in the country. The clerk then stated, there is only one recognised time, that is new time, which is official government time. And Mr. Kinsley then said, the majority of the members thought the meeting was to be held in old time. To which the chairman responded, we are now going by new time. Mr. P. Byrne asked, do you recognise the new time? 
and the chairman stated, It is not what I recognise. We have decided that the two tenders be held over for the present. Farmers also dispute the daylight savings. One heading read, Farmers Meetings, Opposition to Enforcement of Summertime. Another one with the heading of Summertime stated that on the motion of Reverend Mr. Benson Temple Shampoo, seconded by Mr. MacDonald, a resolution was passed protesting strongly against the enforcement of summertime, and that several delegates pointed out the inconvenience it caused to farmers. While the civil war on County Wexford affected many people in different ways, there were some incidents which were out of the ordinary. One such case was reported in the Echo newspaper in February of 1923 and came with the heading Bomb in the Slaney. It was reported that while fishing for pike near Goff's flat between Inniscorty and Scar Welsh on Sunday, a Mr Tim Butler of Spring Valley, a well-known fisherman, felt his line foul. Carefully he drew it up, when he found to his great astonishment that the line had become entangled in the ring of a mills bomb. An ex-soldier named Hawkins, who was fishing nearby, released the line and the bomb, which someone must have thrown into this lady, was subsequently handed over to the military. And that brings an end to our look at the social history of County Wexford in 1923. I hope you have enjoyed looking at this video and that now you have a better understanding of what life was like in the county 100 years ago. Thank you very much.